Um, essentially, this reading is uh, being told to the Hebrews and saying, look, God has made a promise and has taken an oath. And if you look back at Noah, if you look at Abraham, if you look at these various um, ancestors of yours, you will see that God has been faithful in God's word. So we will pick it up with Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. God also bound himself with an oath so that those he promised to help would be perfectly sure and never need to wonder whether he might change his plans. He has given us both his promise and his oath, two things we can completely count on for it is impossible for God to tell a lie. Now all those who flee to him to save them can take new courage when they hear such assurances from God. Now they can know without doubt that he will give them the salvation he promised to them. This certain hope of being saved is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, connecting us with God himself behind the sacred curtains of heaven where Christ has gone ahead to plead for us from his position as our high priest with the honor and the rank of Melchizedek. I knew I wasn't going to get that out. It's the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather here in this sacred space, we thank you for your fellowship we thank you for family. We thank that you that you continue to strengthen us and restore us and inspire us with your love. Fill us with your peace so our souls would pour out peace and love, compassion to others. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, Amen. You know, we don't need to suffer a tragic, devastating loss to see God's miraculous touch and, and presence uh, in the darkest times of our lives. And, and, and I want to be careful because up until this point, when we look at the singers that we've, or, or the writers rather, that have written the hymns, they all seem to have had one dramatic point that changes their life. Uh, you know, they take me as I am. I don't have to be perfect to come to God. I can be ill and angry, and I can still be accepted by God. John Newton, who had a, a, a horrible life up into his point of conversion. If you look at Charles we um, Wesley, all of the writers have had tragedy somewhere in their life that kind of brings them to this point to write these incredibly inspirational songs we've been looking at. And while it's very true that most of our most enduring hymns have come as a result of that tragedy or that despair or that illness um, or from some dramatic experience, great is thy faithfulness is really the reverse. It's just a simple little song written about ordinary things. You know, it, it's, it's simply one man's reflection. You can't point to a, a time in his life, there is no drama in his life that forces us to, to uh, understand how he, he writes the hymn. The author is Thomas Obadiah Chisholm. And he came to the realization that morning by morning, God remains faithful every day, every day in and out, regardless of what happens in the largest and the smallest of circumstances. So this is really a very ordinary song and a very simple one. Now Chisholm, who described himself at, at some times as just an old shoe, was born in a crude log cabin in Franklin, Kentucky in 1866. 
Nothing remarkable about him. He had very little education, but nevertheless at 16 became a teacher at the school he attended. Later on, he became the uh, assistant to the uh, editor of the local press. And he did those jobs for a number of years. And then finally had a conversion experience at the age of 27, but it was the result of a revival. It was nothing traumatic in his life. He did choose to pursue um, becoming a minister. And although he did not have the formal education, um, he was ordained and became a pastor at the age of 36. Now, unfortunately, he did not have good health. That seems to be another theme that runs through a lot of our authors of, of great hymns. And then because of that, he could only minister in a, in a church for one year. He had to leave after that because uh, for the rest of his life, he just kind of struggled with his illness, and he became an insurance agent in New Jersey. And during that time, he wrote over 1,200 poems and hymns, most of which we will never hear of or see of again. Very few were published or written. And those that were are not very memorable. And although he was ill, he lived to the age of 93, dying in 1960. But it was back in 1923 that this over-the-hill man, at the age of 57, sits down and pens the poem to how great is, or, um, great is thy faithfulness. And it's a poem. He just throws it in a stack with the other poems he's written. But he gets a dis an itch, and he, he decides to send some of the poems off to the Hope Publishing Company, actually here in Illinois. Um, and I want to say in the western suburbs, but I could be wrong. Carol Stream. Carol Stream, thank you. So they're still around. Sends a, a number of the poems, and William Ryan, who is working there, is absolutely awestruck by that particular poem. And so impressed was he with that poem, he felt he just had to write the music to it, but he wasn't sure if he could do justice to the words. But he went ahead and tried. And I guess I'd have to say he was pretty successful. Now the song is based on the Book of Lamentations, or at least a, a part of the Book of Lamentations. And we'll talk about that in, in a couple of minutes, but let's keep in mind that, that that's its source. Once the song is published, it becomes very popular with the Moody Bible Institute and, of course, the Billy Graham Crusades in the, the 40s and 50s and 60s. And again, thanks to the effort of George Beverly Shea, this song becomes a standard because of all of the people who hear it at the Billy Graham Crusades. And so um, it, it really is an inspiration. And, one, and perhaps on one of these sermons, we'll, we'll run a clip of, of uh, Shea singing. I, don't, I can't get a clip of this song, but I have one of How Great Thou Art um, that you can get on YouTube. And I think we'll run it so that you get an idea of who he is and the power in his voice and uh, just get an appreciation for this man who helped mentor and maintain uh, great classic hymns. So Chisholm, at age 75, is kind of reflecting on his life and the fact that God's presence is there in his ordinary life. And he writes, My income has not been large at any time, due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, in that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. When we think of faithfulness, what do we think of? 
We think of people who are firm in his or her commitment. They take a vow or an oath and they hold to it. They keep their promises. They're reliable. They're loyal. When we think of all of the people in the Bible, around the issue of faithfulness, the one that, that struck Chisholm was Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah has the attribution of being the writer of Lamentations. And he's a good representative. Now, scholars don't believe today that Jeremiah is the writer of Lamentation. I think it's an attribution. Um, most think it's a variety of people who have written it. If you have not read Lamentations, that's not surprising. It's not a real upbeat book. It's a dirge. It is nothing but sorrowful poems that are talking about the time in which the Israelites are being oppressed by the Babylonians and Jerusalem is being torn apart and Jeremiah is trying to give them hope in the middle of it and nobody's listening to them. It, it's it's a, a book about the sorrows and the tragedies that, that happened to a group of people over a period of time. And Jeremiah knows God is faithful. And given all that goes on around him, of the death, of the imprisonment, of the dying, of the crumbling of buildings, the lack of food, he knows that every morning God is there with his mercy and his compassion for his people. And after all that Jeremiah endures, among all of the tragedy that he lives through, Jeremiah is able to stand in the middle of all of that rubble and declare how great and faithful his God is. And that's what Chisholm saw in, in the book and in the clip that we read this morning. Now the song has three stanzas. The first stanza is a simple expression of God's steadfast love that never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. Jeremiah has an excellent grasp of the reality of God. He knows that whether things are going well or going badly, God is still there. God is still faithful. God will promises will be kept. And Jeremiah finds hope in all of this situation, a hopeless situation, frankly, that his belief and faithfulness in God is based on his knowledge that God will stay faithful to God's word. Verse 2 gives us a beautifully graphic lesson on the faithfulness of God revealed in creation. The seasons, nature, the sun, the moon, the stars all continue on their course perfectly without any interference from us. Nature goes on in an orderly, perfectly quiet manner, unless we interfere with it. But if we can keep our noses out of it, nature goes on very nicely without us, thank you very much. No help needed. The seasons roll around. We live in a, in a four-season area, which is awesome. By the way, yesterday I saw the first red leaves on a maple tree um, up in Palatine, so uh, fall must be a-coming. We do nothing to make the seasons come. They come on their own. God's little mercies. You get up and have air to breathe. You get up and have water to drink. You have food to eat. You have a place to live. You have beauty to surround you. Little mercies.
that God provides. And this is what the song in Lamentations is, or the song rather, is saying, that the, the promises that God made will stay true. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. It's an incredible thought. Look at what goes on around you every single day that you have absolutely nothing to do with, and it's there. Not unlike the, the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt and escaping, and God provided manna every morning. You do not have to worry. Trust me, I will feed you. You'll get quail at night, manna in the morning. Trust me. But they couldn't. This is what Jeremiah is trying to tell us. Verse 3 reminds us of God's faithfulness when it comes to the promised eternal salvation of Christ. It's a testimony to the peace that comes to us through the redemption it's a testimony of God's abiding presence in our daily lives, the forgiveness of our sins, and the hope that we'll receive God's gift of eternal life. And the refrain, love the refrain, it echoes the infinite faithfulness of God to extend mercy and compassion. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. All that we need is provided to us. That is how faithful our God is to us. Now, I'll be honest. You know, God may have promised you an eternal life. He didn't promise us an easy one. We've all experienced mountains of success and we've experienced valleys of, of sadness and failures. At this very moment, every one of you and me are faced with issues and challenges and problems and concerns and worries and doubts. And it is at that time and I think in, in, in so many cases, it's the time that the, the more intense the, the, the failure or the, the pain or the issue is, the more likely we are to pull away from God instead of running to God. We love to hang with God when things are going well. But when things aren't going our way, there's a tendency for so many of us to start pulling away instead of coming closer to. And I think the reason for that is we forget that, that God has made a promise that God cannot break. And God's faithfulness to us is infinite and unending. And our faithfulness to him should be the same. And I know it's hard. There are times, even now, when I feel like I'm being turned in 27 directions and I'm not looking towards God. I'm trying to figure out the answer myself. Until you finally hit that point, and isn't it sad that we have to hit that point, when you finally go, you know what, maybe I'll pray. There's, there's a last ditch effort. Instead of a first effort, it becomes the last thing we think of doing. So our faithfulness needs to be a little bit stronger. This hymn is a reminder that God's promises are true. God does not change. His compassions never fail. And his faithfulness to us in Christ Jesus is more than good. It is great. You know, it, it doesn't really take an incredibly gifted or wildly famous person to, pro to proclaim the faithfulness of God. 
You don't need to be famous. You don't need to write a, a world famous hymn. You just need to be a faithful person. Amen.